Hello everyone. I want to welcome you to episode two of our livestock judging series. My name is Sarah Townley and I'm a 4-H professional with the University of Missouri Extension. I'm headquartered in Jasper County, Missouri. If you're joining us after watching episode one, I'd like to welcome you back. The title of episode two is Different Strokes and we're going to be discussing breeds of livestock today. So some of you guys that are watching may be a little bit more experienced in the judging world and you're kind of itching to get into some more of the technical and more advanced judging aspects and some judging practice. Um, but my intent with filming this series is for those who are have little to no experience with livestock judging to be able to kind of grasp the basic concept, concepts and um, kind of start from the beginning, start from the ground up. So this episode is really for some, more, some of the newer judges or maybe some of those who have less experience with livestock in general. Ideally, someone who has no farm experience or who has never showed livestock would be able to watch this series and really get a good idea of how to judge livestock and some of the why behind it and grasp some of those concepts. So for you who um, have more experience with livestock judging, this will be a review for you guys and some of you younger ones or newer ones. Well, maybe you'll learn some new things and kind of get a little bit more of an idea of some of the concepts behind livestock judging. So I also want um, to make sure that you guys know that my intent for this episode is not an in-depth memorization of facts. You're not going to have to answer when you go to a livestock judging contest, they're not going to have, have you um, tell the date that the Angus Association was established or any kind of hard facts like that. Basically, my intent with this episode is for you guys to be familiar with the common breeds that you're going to see at judging contests and to be familiar with common traits for each breed. And we'll kind of discuss the why here as we get started. So our objectives for this episode is to be able to distinguish between breeds within a species. And remember our four species that we're gonna see in livestock judging are cattle, beef cattle, swine, sheep, and meat goats. And we want to be able to identify distinguishing characteristics of each breed. So first we're going to talk a little bit about what a breed is. And so from you guys from episode one, or if you guys are some of my 4-H kids, you should have a handout with fill in the blanks. If you are watching from elsewhere or you're just now joining us, go ahead and email the uh, contact that is in the video description for that handout. So a breed is defined as a group of animals with a common origin, which are distinguished by characteristics within a species. And we're gonna kind of talk about the origins for each of the breeds and, and um, groups of breeds that we're gonna talk about. Again, don't stress too hard about memorizing those hard facts. We just kind of want you guys to be able to understand. Breed character is defined as the characteristics that allow the breed of the individual animal to be determined. Different purebred breeds have genetic strengths and weaknesses. And the offspring, also known as progeny, so if you guys see that um, at a judging contest, if you're given a scenario or um, performance data, that's what the word progeny means, the offspring of an individual. Of different purebred breeds is gonna result in an animal that has genetic advantages compared to his parents. This is called hybrid vigor or heterosis. And so, one of the things we're going to talk about, especially in the beef cattle and sheep breeds that we're going to talk about today, is some popular crossbreeds and why they were developed and why they're important. All right, all I have is a pin and I don't have a pointer, but you guys can kind of see that first picture top left was 1932. That Hereford steer is um, not too terribly different, um, just not wildly different from that one you see at the bottom. Um, maybe just a little bit smaller in size, but not just drastically different than the one you see there at the very bottom. So that next one, you can see that's the year 1953. That's a little bit post-World War II. Um, and kind of during those that 1940s and 50s era, what was really popular um, for the Hereford breed was to be small and compact and very fatty. So you see how short he is compared to the guy that's leading him um, and only weighs a thousand pounds compared to that guy to the left. So uh, moving on to that next picture in 1971, you've got to see the difference between 1953 and 71. About post-World War II era, there was less of a demand for the products like 
tallow um, and people had more of a demand for lean meat. And so kind of less of the fat, more of the muscle and more of that growth, like that animal that you see in that 1971 picture was what the Hereford breed um, was kind of developed to be. And so this next picture you can kind of see, um, I'm not sure what happened in between the middle of these photos, um, in terms of comparing this guy to the 2007 Fort Worth Stock Show, uh, which is pretty, pretty current. I mean, it's been, this video is being filmed in 2020, so it's been 13 years since this picture was taken, but it's, it's still pretty comparatively up to date, this guy in the last picture. Um, if you compare him to that guy from 1978, he just doesn't quite have um, the balance and the finish that this, that we want for um, kind of some of the Hereford animals that you'll see today. So what I really want you guys to get out of this picture is that market trends and consumer taste or preference matter. And so trends and demand are always changing. And it's important for us to keep up to date on these trends when we are evaluating livestock. So we're going to dive right in, get right into some of the beef breeds that you guys might see when you're judging livestock. So we really want to break um, break these down into two different species that cattle breeds as we know today originate from, and that's Boss Taurus breeds and Boss Indicus breeds. And so those Boss Indicus breeds are going to be um, categorized into three different groups, all the dairy cattle that you'll see today, the British breeds, and the continental breeds. And I do want to make a point to say um, we won't need to memorize facts about dairy cattle because of course, that's not something you're going to see a whole lot of, if at, ever at all, when you're judging livestock. Um, just want to make you familiar with that category of boss taurus breeds. So really quickly, we'll just kind of go over what dairy breeds there are. Um, you guys have probably seen Holstein. That's definitely the most popular breed of dairy cow. Um, they come in black and white or red and white. Jersey cattle, which are the second most popular breed of dairy cattle, at least in the industry, and they're known for having high milk fat content. Uh, Guernsey cattle, Ayrshire cattle, and Brown Swiss, and a milking shorthorn. So again, don't want to spend too much time on facts with those. Just want you guys to see the pictures and kind of be familiar with it. So um, we're going to talk about the next two categories of Boss Taurus breeds, starting with all right, it wouldn't let me go back on my slides, so I had to go back. All right, so you look at this Angus breed and the Hereford breed and the Shorthorn breed. They're all uh, smaller in frame size. We're going to talk um, about which ones have different, different frame sizes. They're known to be smaller, medium, and they're all pretty well known for calving ease. Um, that's one thing that when you go to a judging contest, if you judge breeding bulls, that's one thing that performance Angus bulls are known for is lower birth weights and ease of capping. So next, um, our third category of the continental breeds, or the Boss Taurus breeds, excuse me, is going to be continental breeds. So these ones originated elsewhere in Europe, and we're, we're going to talk about the countries they originated in and talk a little bit about how to pronounce the breed, because sometimes if you never heard of these, you might um, read them and think they're pronounced a little bit differently. Um, this one you guys probably see a lot of and even if you're not familiar with cattle you probably recognize these guys as the white cows this is pronounced charlet if you aren't familiar um with cattle breeds it looks like it's pronounced if if you're <laughs> um if you never heard it before you might think it's pronounced like char o lace um, but it's pronounced charlet because it's french and they are known for their color they're cream colored or white and they're the only continental breed that doesn't have a black variety. And uh, you guys are probably aware that in the industry, the beef industry, uh, black hided cows are what is popular, what is well liked. And Charlet are at least the only ones in the continental breed that don't come in a black variety. And one of the few actually that haven't been um, bred to have a black hided variety. So what Charlet are known for is their growth, having a large frame size, their hardiness, especially to weather and the environment so they can stand up to um, heat or cold. And you can see in the picture that cow in the picture is horned and that's how they naturally are. Uh, but through some of the Charlet breeding programs over the years, they've produced naturally pulled Charlet cattle. All right, so this next one, 
<laughs> take a second if you guys have never seen this breed before just kind of take a guess in your head as to how you think this one's pronounced all right so you might you might think this one's like chinia or chinina or um, something to that effect this one originates in italy and it's actually pronounced kianina so these ones are also solid white um, originally solid white or like a steel silver color with black points um, so you see that black nose, that's kind of the difference between um, that last one, that Charlet, which, and it doesn't let me go back in my slideshow here, it only lets me go forward, but um, the Charlets have more of that pink nose, that white body with the pink nose, and you can see um, this gal right here has a black nose or black tail. And this one's not going to be some one that's overly popular in the grand scheme of livestock judging, but it is one of the more popular out of all of the cattle breeds out there, which there are a lot, this is one of the more popular beef breeds. So they are also known for their large frame size, um, as well as their muscles and their growth. And they will typically have horns that will curve forward, little short horns like they see on that cow in the picture. Next is Gelby. That one's actually pretty popular um, in this area in, in the Midwest. And it's one that you'll see at nearly every county fair in this area. Some of you guys that are watching probably show Gelby cattle. So this one's a German breed. It originated in Germany, and they are originally red in color. So like I said, a lot of them are bred to have black hided varieties. Um, and we talk about red cows. Delphives usually um, are more of like a lighter yellowy red, as opposed to some of the breeds that have like a, they're known for a cherry red color. So they are also originally horned, but they have been bred to be pulled. Um, and so kind of real quick, talking about, um, for some of you guys who maybe aren't quite as familiar with cattle or livestock, why do we care if they have horns or not? So there are a lot of cow cattle breeds, um, some that are known for docility, some that are not, um, but really why we would care about, um, a couple different reasons why we care about having naturally pulled cattle is, um, first of all, Think about for a second if you, um, and it doesn't necessarily directly have to do with the breed, the level of docility. Anyone who's who's raised cattle or livestock in general knows that um, just when you have a herd, every now and again, you will get a crazy one, or you might get a mean one, or even just kind of in, in general, mamas when they have babies tend to be more aggressive. If you have a crazy one, if you have one that you cannot turn your back on, um, that you do not want to make mad, would you rather her have horns or not? So that's kind of, um, it's just easier and safer. And of course, like um, with bulls or steers, fighting is just easier if they don't hurt each other with the horns. Um, and also with that, if they're naturally uh, pulled, then you don't have to go through the process of dehorning. So that's a little bit about the horn versus pulled and why uh, beef producers desire to have pulled cattle. And the Gelby breed is known for fast growth or um, uh, early maturity, their fertility, and a quiet temperament. Next, we're going to talk about limousine cattle. Um, and it is pronounced just like that, limousine, not like limousine, the car. Um, these ones originated in France, and they are originally kind of that red color that you see in the picture, more like a medium red or an orange red. They are known for their meat yield and their hardiness. And so kind of um, if you do a little research over limousine cattle, one thing they're not necessarily known for is docility. They kind of have a reputation among some people um, for being nervous or flighty or even aggressive. Um, people have stories of, of limousine cattle doing things like jumping a fence. Uh, but over the years, limousine breeders have acknowledged this and made this a priority in their breeding over the last few years. So you're gonna have some breeds that are just naturally more docile. And that is one thing that you can select and breed for is temperament. Um, and that's one thing limousine is known for, for their meat yield and their hardiness, say to like their environment and um, the weather or pests, um, but not so much for docility. But that strong point of that limousine is being known for their. This one, we have another, uh, <laughs> another French one. And this one's the, not too hard to figure out and pronunciation on this one. This one's Maine Anjou. They are originally red and white spotted and typically you can you can recognize them today by their white with red spots, um, cherry red. They're white with dark, like a deep cherry red. 
color um, spots, and they're used extensively in show cattle genetics. That's one thing um, that they're used for in the industry. They are known for their size, their muscle, um, also decently large frame cattle like a lot of these continental breeds are, um, muscle and easy fattening as well, as well as their milk production. And so you're going to see a few of these breeds uh, of cattle as well as um, I think there's some sheep that we've noted for being um, heavy milkers, good milk production. And so here we aren't necessarily talking about milk production um, necessarily for human consumption. Um, although, I mean, you, you can drink drink cow's milk from, from any cow. It's not gonna, going to hurt you or anything like that. It's just uh, there's certain breeds that are bred for milking um, that, we, that we drink for human consumption. Uh, but when we talk about this in the beef breeds, we were talking about how good of a mama is she and how well can she feed that baby. So Maine and Juice are known for um, good milk production for those babies that they produce. All right, here's another fresh one. And this one is a little bit tricky in the name if you never heard of this one. So this one looks like it would be pronounced Sailors if you've never heard um, of this breed before. I, it seems like I remember a lot of my livestock professors in college calling them Saliers. But if you look this up online, a lot of sources are going to tell you that it's pronounced Salers. Um, because it is French. So Solaires is how you say that. Um, they're originally dark red in color um, and they have very versatile genetics. They've been bred um, to have a lot of different traits over the years. They can come in horned or pulled varieties. It can come in red or black varieties, so on and so forth. Um, one thing they're known for is their environmental hardiness. So we kind of talk about breeds um, that can stand up to the cold or to the heat. And especially once we get to Boston, the kids breeds, we're going to talk about some crossbreeds um, and how they stand up to the heat. So that's one thing Solaires are known for is um, environmental hardiness, as well as their foraging ability. So think for a second, why um, would a good foraging ability be beneficial to a producer? So an animal that is good at foraging is going to be very efficient for that farmer. And they're going to, in the event of, say, a drought or something like that, going to hold up a little better than an animal who has um, less of an ability to forage. So also um, the amount of hay that you're feeding and so on and so forth, that animal is going to be a little bit more efficient on their feed. And we talked about feed efficiency in episode one. Um, that's a strong suit. That's saving a farmer money um, and growing better on less feed. So feed efficiency is a good trait. And lastly, this is the very last one we're going to talk about um, on the continental breeds. And you guys are probably very familiar with Cimental cattle. So um, like we said, they a lot of breeds are bred to have black hide. And that's why I included that picture on there. Um, we Like we said, the Charlet is the only continental breed that is not bred to have a black hide. But it is um, very common, very common in Cimental cattle for you to see um, black hided ones and some of you guys may even raise and show some and tall cattle so with that fact that pretty much every breed nowadays is bred to have a black hided variety how can you tell them apart especially because black angus and simmental are going to be some breeds that you're going to see a lot in livestock judging they're both very common breeds how can you tell them apart so like we said, um, the continental breeds are known more for a larger frame size, whereas those British breeds like the Angus and the Hereford are known for having a smaller frame size. So if you see an all black cow, um, Angus are going to be smaller all around and more petite. So Angus cows typically top out at around 1,200 pounds when they're mature, whereas a Simmental cow may top out anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. Same thing with bulls, an Angus bull will uh, usually reach a mature weight of 1,900 pounds, whereas a Simmental bull will reach a mature weight of 2,900 pounds. So, and also you can kind of look at, at their face shape. Let me grab a pin here. Let me, oh, it won't let me draw on top of the picture there. Um, but you kind of get the point. If you look at that top, um, top cow there and you see kind of the size of her head, Generally, also, those larger frame cattle will have longer faces and bigger heads as opposed to more petite um, 
smaller framed breeds. So also want to touch on um, Simmental established in Switzerland. Again, kind of that um, trademark look of the Simmentals that red and white spotted, but now they're very, very commonly um, black hided and they are known for their frame size, their growth, and their milk production. All right, last but not least, when it comes to cattle breeds, we're gonna talk about Boss Indicus breeds. Um, and there's just one category here, and that's what's known as the American breeds. So this first one we're gonna talk about that you may or may not be familiar with is the American Brahmin. Um, and this one is um, all the rest of them that we talk about from here on out are gonna have um, some Brahmin influence or crossbreeding. So first, um, before we kind of get into this, I want you guys to look at the animal in this picture. What traits do you notice and why do you think they might be beneficial? All right, so one thing you guys might have noticed, um, oops. There we go, I found my laser pointer, so I can show you guys. Um, one thing you guys may have noticed, first of all, um, look right here. Look at those ears and how those look different than some of the other ones that we've talked about so far. They have big, large, drooping ears. Um, and one thing you also may have noticed here is that they have looser flaps of skin than some of the other breeds. They're a little wrinklier. Um, and also, you may have noticed this hump. Uh, especially that the loose skin and the, the big ears um, make this uh, make this breed that originated in India um, excellent at standing up to the heat and standing up to parasites. So that's one strong um, trait in this breed and you may hear them referred to as eared cattle. That's what a lot of people call them as eared cattle. Um, and they typically are gray or red in color, gray kind of like this one. Um, and that hump, that is kind of the trademark Brahmin thing is to um, also have a hump in addition to the ears. Don't confuse this too much with the fact that all bulls of any breed are going to have somewhat of that thick neck and that hump. That's just, um, that's just masculinity. And remember, we kind of, if you are coming from episode one, we kind of talked about masculinity and femininity um, and how we want the girls to look like girls and the boys to look like boys. And that's one thing we especially judge breeding cattle on um, and breeding animals in general is masculinity and femininity. Um, and so I just wanted to point that out real quick that this kind of trademark hump on this American Brahmin um, is, is um, it's kind of thing that all of any, any of the animals in the breed, cows, uh, bulls, any of the above is going to have, but don't confuse that with the fact that all breeds of bulls are gonna have that thick neck just because they're, they're males. So the first breed, um, and like I said, all breeds from that first slide on, um, all the rest of them are going to be animals that are crossbred with American Brahmin. So the, this first one's Brayford, and you could probably tell by um, by its coloring, by its traits, by all its on um, all its features, it is a Brahmin and Hereford cross. So this breed was developed in Florida. Think about it for a second. What? How would you describe Florida? What is the weather like in Florida? It's hot, and so that original breed was developed in India, where it is hot, um, and so. If you think about it, we kind of talked about that hybrid vigor. So beef producers in Florida wanted that Hereford breed, that docility, that fertility, all the things we love about the Hereford breed. But those cattle had a little bit harder time down in Florida dealing with the heat. So we crossbreed with a Brahmin and they're one of their best traits is standing up to the heat and to bugs, to parasites, flies, so on and so forth and we breed them to get the best of both traits. So the Brayford breed is known for fertility, which that's one thing I wanna mention real quickly. We talked a little bit about how um, those British breeds, those Angus and um, Hereford and Shorthorn are known for uh, light birth weights and calving ease. That's one thing that also, despite typically having a large frame size, um, Brahmin and Brahmin influenced cattle are known for um, good birth weights and calving ease. 
So that's one thing the Brayford breed is known for is fertility and that calving ease and being good mamas. And I'm gonna say I still have my <laughs> still have my laser pointer and it skipped ahead real quick. Um, but they have different um different I guess guidelines for red and black different red and black breeds and how you can and can't register. Um, so again, known for heat and humidity resistance because of that Brahmin in them, and they are excellent mothers. This one, um, and I'm I'm a little partial. This is one of my personal favorite beef breeds out there. This one's called Beef Master. Um, and, and in the past, my family, my dad has raised Beef Master cattle. There's not quite as much uh, ear to cattle in the herd anymore. We mostly raise Angus and Brangus and um, some other crossbred cattle that have some other breeds like Herford and Simmental. There are still some uh, Beef Master or Brahmin influence in our herd, but a lot less than there used to be. The Beef Master is a cross between a Herford, a Shorthorn, and a Brahmin. They were developed in South Texas. What's it like in South Texas? It's hot, hot and dry usually. And so this one, um, again, bred for that South Texas heat, recognized by the USDA as a pure breed in 1954. So they've been around a while in the United States. Um, most often you're gonna stare this color kind of like you see them um, in this picture, like that red brown color. A lot of the ones on our farm or the ones that I've seen kind of sometimes will have an orangey color, like maybe a little bit lighter than that guy in the picture, but there are actually no color standards for the breed, according to the, the Breed Association, which is called Beef Master Breeders United. So they are bred according to um, what the Breed Association considers the six essentials, which are weight, confirmation, milking ability, fertility, hardiness, and disposition. So the last one we're going to talk about here is called Santa Gertrudis. And this one is a fact that, um, of course, again, you're probably not going to be necessarily asked to, pop, to you know, kind of pop off this one off at a livestock judging contest. But one of the most notable facts about this breed is it was developed on the King Ranch in Texas. And make a note again, what's it like in Texas? It's hot and dry. And so this one's a cross between Shorthorn and Brahmin. And they are known for having that deep cherry red color. Also known for calving ease, good mothering abilities, and their tolerance to heat and insects. That was a lot to take in. So if you need, uh, it's been about 27 minutes um, of recording on this video so far. If you need to pause, take a break, walk around. Um, and again, I forgot to mention, you guys have probably figured it out by now. If you have the handout, this part where we're talking about individual breeds, there's no fill in the blanks. I just kind of wanted you guys, you have your notes there on the different breeds and kind of their different traits. But again, don't stress too much over memorizing those hard facts. So when you're ready to move on, um, next we're going to talk about swine breeds. And this is going to go pretty fast. And um, we have, I think, nine breeds I counted to talk about. And we're going to move through those pretty quickly. All the facts and all the photos that are in this section on swine are going to come from Pork Checkoff. Take a second, look at our Landrace hog once again. Look at the name, we know what it's called, it's called Landrace. We said they're a white hog with floppy ears. Your Yorkshire is a white hog with erect ears. Notice how her ears stand up, you can see her eye. One thing that I want you guys to take away from this and kind of how you can distinguish between breeds of hogs is if there is this S-H-I-R-E, Shire, at the end of their name, they're going to have the ears that stand up versus, and we'll kind of pay attention to this as each with each breed as we go along. Um, if they don't have that at the end of their breed's name, their ears are kind of like the land race. They'll you know flop over, droop onto their face. Again, this is a white breed. It's a maternal breed. And the Yorkshire is actually the most recorded breed of pig in North America. They are known for their muscle, high proportion of lean meat, low back fat, and their strength and their durability. Next, we're gonna talk about a hog that's called the Duroc. And what do, you, what do you notice about the ears? They are a red color with droopy ears. And this picture really doesn't do it justice because he kind of looks more like a pink red or a tan red. Um, usually they're very red, like a, a darker red. And that's how you'll know the Duroc breed, how you can recognize them. They're a terminal breed, known for their growth, 
their product quality and their carcass yield. So we said the Yorkshire is the most required or recorded, excuse me, for swine breed in the U.S. The Duroc is going to come in second. So the second most popular, um, at least for what's recorded. The next one, pay attention to the name, Hampshire. This one um, is going to, of course, we note that the ears stand up. This one is also known for being the belted hog. Hampshire hogs are going to be black with a white belt around their shoulders, and those front feet are usually going to be white. Um, they're a terminal breed known for their meat yield, their high carcass quality, lean muscling, muscling, minimal back fat, and large loin eyes. And so they're going to be most popular in the corn belt, which if you guys are, are my kids or watching from close to my region, you are in the corn belt. That's mostly going to be Iowa, Illinois, and um, parts of Indiana, Nebraska, um, and Kansas, and all of Missouri. So kind of Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, and the, kind of, and the surrounding areas like um, eastern Kansas, eastern Nebraska, western Indiana is going to be where the corn belt is. Basically where a lot of the corn in America is grown, kind of that Midwest, northern Midwest. That's where Hampshire pigs are most popular. Next one, we have another one that ends in the S-H-I-R-E. And um, note the ears stand up. This breed's color is going to be black with six white points. So you can kind of see on this guy, of course, black body. He's got little white socks on. That's what we mean by points. His nose is white. The tip of his tail is white. And he also has some white on his ear. So black with, with six white points and the ears that stand up. This one's also a terminal breed. And so we talked about Yorkshires are the first most popular breed in the United States. Durox are the second. And Berkshires are going to come in third. So what they are known for is fast and efficient growth, which we like, reproductive efficiency, clean, cleanness and meat flavor and value. So the American Berkshire Association is actually the oldest swine registry in the world, and that was formed in the late 1870s. Next one's Chester White. This one was actually named for the county it was developed, Chester County, Pennsylvania. And this is the third um, white breed that we've talked about. There are three white breeds that we're going to talk about. So we talked about Land Race, we talked about Yorkshire, and then there's Chester White. Those are your three white breeds and your three maternal breeds. So Chester White doesn't have S-H-I-R-E in the name, so it has the droopy ears. They have the best meat quality of those three white breeds. And they're known for their mothering ability as well as their durability and their soundness. Next, we're going to talk about Poland China. Um, note he kind of looks like the Berkshire that we looked at. They are also black with six white points. Difference between Poland China and the Berkshire is the ears, because the Berkshire, again, ends in that S H I R E, and Poland China does not. And they are used in show pig genetics. They're known for having a large frame size, long bodies, and for their leanness and muscle on their carcasses. All right, this one is either the last or the second to last. Um, this one's spotted, kind of look like that pole in China, um, except they're white with the black spots and they have those floppy ears. Also a terminal breed. And just like the pole in China, they're used quite a bit in show pig genetics. Um, feed efficiency. We've talked about that. We really like feed efficiency. Producers like that always strive um, for having less input costs. Um, the rate of gain, rapid rate of gain, and a good carcass quality is what spotted hogs are known for. So we talked a little bit about maternal traits or maternal breeds versus terminal. And so those three white breeds that we talked about, Landrace, Yorkshire, and Chester White, are known for their excellent mothering abilities, as well as um, like those land races are known for um, large litters and heavy milking. And so the other breeds, the, the ones that are not white, are selected for growth and carcass merit. So those are going to be the ones that are more selected based on um, hanging a carcass, being able to eat them, house their meat. So we're going to get through, through swine breeds in a shorter time than um, cat, beef cattle breeds. There are a lot of beef breeds. Next, real quickly, we're going to talk about sheep breeds and then very, very briefly go over goats. So we're going to talk about three main categories of sheep. There um, are hair sheep, which I are not necessarily very common, especially in this part of the country. So I bet this is not going to be something you should expect to see a livestock judging contest, but don't 
don't quote me as saying you'll never see it because because you might but um there are hair breeds wool breeds and meat breeds which the meat breeds are going to be probably a, a lot of what you'll see in the market classes so there's just two hair breeds you really need to know about the dorper which is developed in south africa where again that's another place where it's hot as well as the katahdin which is developed in maine so these are really what you need to know about them is they just have hair instead of wool and you can see it a little better um, on this katahdin because this guy's pretty pretty well shorn and um, he has hair instead of wool so first we're going to talk about some of the wool breeds the first one is the merino which is um what you guys probably need to note about this one is that they are known for essentially having the best wool they're a fine wool breed and they have the highest quality fleece they originated in spain you can probably tell the name merino they're from spain and they cross breed very well now remember whenever we talked about um, american brahmin how one of their best traits is heat tolerance and we can cross them with other breeds so that those other breeds can have that good trait um, of being heat tolerant that's kind of what we do um, with the merino and some of the other breeds because they have the best quality fleece we can cross them with other breeds and improve wool quality next um <laughs> this one uh, is called rambouillet and they're actually a derivative of the merino breed so they're used extensively in the western u.s so um kind of that texas california arizona colorado new mexico um, they're very agile so as in their movements they're very um i guess you might want to say they have good footing um, and ideal flocking behavior and both of those make them excellent mountain animals which is kind of what you're going to see over in that western united states like in arizona kind of those desert mountain areas um, and their flocking behavior also helps them defend against predators the next one is the columbia kind of if you look at this guy and um, they're large framed so that's one thing um, that they're noted for is having a large frame they're actually a cross between a rainbow lay that last slide that we looked at and then a lincoln which is going to be the next slide after that lincoln sheep the columbia breed was actually developed by the usda and established in 1912 and is considered the first american breed they're also often considered dual purpose they have good fleece um, but also um, as you can see down there that last bullet point um, known for having good carcass traits and the ability and in addition to their superior mothering abilities and that heavy milk production they have great meat but an accidentally stuck and i skipped to um so you're having a lot of technical difficulties with this one today the next one we talked about the columbia is a cross between um the rambouillet and the lincoln this one is the lincoln and as you can probably tell from the photo this is a long wool breed so it was named for Lincolnshire County in England, England, where it was developed, like a lot of breeds are named for um, the place in which they are developed. Large mature size, um, also known for having the thickest fleece of all the breeds, as well as a clean, large, lean, well-muscled carcass. Um, another wool breed is the Cotswold sheep. And one thing you kind of notice, um, like that Columbia sheep, if you go, um, rewind the video a little bit look at um, the Columbia sheep they're all white and they have that pink nose um, one thing to note about the Cotswold breed is they are a large frame sheep kind of like the last couple we've talked about and they have that black nose that you can kind of see and you can't see his feet um, but they have black feet as well they are known for ha having what's known as open fleece carried in locks which can mat if you don't take care of them they're also known as gentle giants because they have what most people can be quoted saying is a uniquely friendly dispossession so even though they're large framed um as far as most of the sheep breeds are concerned they're known as gentle giants because they're um, uniquely friendly. all right so that's the last of the wool breeds and again um you're going to see a lot of them between the meat and the wool breeds that can be considered dual purpose the first of the meat breeds that we're going to talk about is the shropshire so they're similar in appearance to the Hampshire sheep, which is another one of the meat breeds that here uh, in probably two or three slides, because um, they have that white body and those black legs and face. They're what's known as a medium wool breed, making them a decent dual purpose sheep. They have good wool, they have good meat. They're also known for their um, excellent gentle disposition, their lambing ease, 
and for being good mamas, as well as that excellent muscling that we like in a meat breed. The next one is Dorset. Um, you'll note they are all one of those all white breeds with pink nose. Um, they originated in England, but they're influenced by that Merino breed that we talked about that originated in Spain. They can come in um, a horn variety like you see in that photo, or but they can come pulled. They have desirable carcass traits and wool quality, which makes them one of the most popular in the United States. So they're a little smaller framed than, say, um, Columbia or Rambouillet. So they're good for small family flocks. If you want sheep and you don't have a large farm to put them on, um, Dorsets are good for that. They are similar in appearance to the Shropshires. They have that white body, those black feet, and that black face. Um, they're actually a derivative of the South Down breed developed in England. They're known for being um, large framed as well as heavy muscled, um, known for an excellent growth weight and those desirable carcass traits. Um, so this is one that you'll probably see a lot in livestock judging contests as well as at your local county fair. Um, you guys, a lot of you probably show Hampshire sheep or have friends who do. They're very popular as forage and FFA projects. Montedale sheep. This one actually originated in the United States. They're solid white in color and they have um, that black muzzle and feet. They're also known for their carcass conformation, their growth rate. And again, we talk about growth weight, we kind of talk about that feed, um, feed efficiency, how fast do they grow, how much feed um, are we feeding them, how much is that costing us. Their lambing percentage, meaning how many um, lambs they're able to produce and how many survive, as well as their wool production. The next meat breed is the Oxford sheep. Um, this one's a cross between that Cotswold and the Hampshire sheep, and it's named for Oxford County, England, where it was developed. And they are also a large framed breed, and they have white wool on their body, and on their legs and face, they have kind of like a um, like a mousy brown, like brown gray wool. They are a pulled variety, they don't have horns, and they're known for carcass conformation, heavy fleece, and their lambing percentage. All right, this is getting down um, kind of the end of the sheep breeds. Uh, the next one, next meat breed is going to be South Down, developed in Sussex, England, and they're a smaller framed breed. So they kind of have um, a white body with a mousy colored face, kind of like that gray brown color. And they, that small frame that they have, as well as their excellent disposition, makes them great for small farms, um, for new farmers or new sheep farmers as well as, um, kind of this bottom bullet point, they make excellent forage and FFA projects, and they make excellent projects for new sheep showmen or younger ones. Um, kind of what they're known for as a meat breed um, is that carcass conformation, that early maturity, and their adaptability to varied climates, so that heat or that cold. The last one is a Suffolk sheep. It's pronounced just like that. The L is silent, Suffolk. Um, they also have South Down industry, and, excuse me, ancestry, and they make up the largest number of sheep registrations in the U.S. Um, they also, kind of like um, that Hampshire sheep, they have the black face and legs, and they are known for their hardiness, their growth, and their carcass traits. And this is one more that will make an excellent sheep. Um, kind of, you can see they have a little smaller size, great for a small flock small farm and um, new farmers someone just getting started in raising sheep as well as for a young 4-h or ffa member who wants to show at the fair all right <laughs> we've made it through 43 minutes of this video and i want to assure you guys don't quit now because we only have one breed of goats that we're going to talk about um, and that's because there are there's more than one breed of meat goat but really the boar goat is the meat goat and it's going to be the one that you're going to see the most com most commonly and probably the one you need to pay most attention to in terms of fats so the boar goat how you can tell them is they are white and red in color they're usually um they can be I mean, they can have white or red wherever but usually they're going to be white with a red head and they're the largest of all of the goat breeds they're one of the most popular in the united states and they're very popular, um, kind of like a couple of sheep breeds we talked about, very popular for showing at the fair. They were developed in South Africa, and they were imported to the U.S. in 1994 from Australia and New Zealand. They are the largest um, 
you know, we said they're the largest of the goat of the goat breeds. Um, mature does can weigh between 190 and 230 pounds, and a mature boar buck can weigh between 200 and 340 pounds. So um, they are in high, well, they're known for their docility. We talked about that, um, that they make excellent projects for forage and FFA members, um, also known for high fertility and a fast growth rate. They're in high demand because they grow fast and produce desirable carcasses um, because they may gain in excess of 0.4 pounds per day, and that's under feedlot conditions. So that's what makes them so popular is we talked about feed efficiency. We really like that. Um, animals that grow well and grow efficiently um, are good um, from a producer's standpoint. So really quickly, and you can pause the video if you're curious about my sources. A lot of them come from um, universities, uh, extension services, and breed associations. So thanks for hanging in there. Um, I hope you guys learned something. And if you have any questions um, or if you want the handout that we give, um, with this lesson, go ahead and contact that jasperco at missouri.edu. Um, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in episode three.